Okay, so here we are at uh, Mena's house, uh, and with this uh, wonderful hospitality, as always, Mena. Thank mm. you very much, and for Margaret as well. Thank you. And um, we decided uh, that we would do this. Carl and I have just been to a conference, uh, the Awaken conference, um, in Medstead. And so we had an opportunity to get together because there was something that Carl wanted to discuss as part of his ongoing research, which was also quite interesting to me because of various parallels and crossovers, uh, which we're going to talk about. And it's to do with the uh, War of the Worlds broadcast from 1938. And uh, just to sort of set the scene, Carl's probably going to do a better job than that than me because he's researched it more. But... Um, there's quite a few myths and misconceptions about uh, the broadcast and the build-up to it. Uh, in fact, most people don't know about the build-up to it, which I think you're going to tell us about. And then what happened afterwards, yeah. uh, and there's I think, some false information being circulated, haven't there? So perhaps we'll start off just by setting the scene for what War of the Worlds is and you know what it was in 1938. So if you want to tell us about that. Yeah, um, well, basically what happened was... Um, Orson Welles, the notorious, legendary sort of Hollywood producer, writer, actor, director, um, was heavily involved with um, drama pl uh, plays and things like that, mm -hmm. and he was getting involved with radio as well. He'd uh, he'd played several. I think he played portrayed the Shadow as well, one of the, the sort of uh, cartoon type characters for radio and that. And um, he conceived of this idea of doing. It's it's timely actually because of what we hear going on at the moment in the world, you know, this idea of a fake news um, radio broadcast. He had no real idea about sort of the context and what it was going to be based right. on, but that that was the basic gist behind it. So that's the first thing, isn't it? No, yeah. most people don't know. They just think of this uh, War of the Worlds thing as a drama idea mm. or something. But it, the, you, you're already telling us that he was looking at it not just from a drama thing, but actually. From from a fake news that's, type that's of it. angle. Yeah. Okay. The, the idea was that he would just pick a story that he could hang this fake news story on, basically. Um, and he looked at uh, quite a few stories. He looked at this idea of uh, um, Arthur Conan Doyle, The Lost World, and things like that. And there was another story called The, the Purple Cloud as well. Mm. Fantasy science fiction type stories. Um, and as a, looking at these stories anyway, I could see that none of these stories would have fit in the context of a fact they just weren't believable enough you know yeah, right. the lost world with dinosaurs rampaging through the place you know just wouldn't have worked and i think it was timely we were just short of world war Two and things like that well, we're going to come on to that aren't yeah. we but so war of the worlds itself though for, i mean most people would know what it is but again to tell people that might not know what war of the worlds is and yeah. you know and, and it's uh, you know what the story was and this sort of thing yeah it was it, but, but he chose that story and he and several people went mm -hmm. to the mercury mm -hmm. theater and they they took uh hg wells science fiction story the war of the worlds which was originally set in england um in this part of the world actually sort of down sort of, sort of mm. underway down surrey and places like you know um and what's interesting about it because it ties in with the orson wells aspect on it as well is that hg wells very much set it in based on sort of realistic things he used ordnance survey maps to uh, i mean the story of the war of the worlds for those who don't know it is mm. Mm. is um um, Martian projectiles are ejected from the planet Mars, they come to the Earth and they crash land like sort of they get mistaken for meteors and they contain Martian creatures inside. Eventually they build their own sort of war machines, tripods, which we have one actually here with us as well, yeah, <laughs> keeping us company. Yeah. Um, and they basically just set out across the, the landscape to invade the Earth decimate the landscape, destroy the population and that. And Wells used these ordnance survey maps to plot the route of the Martians. He used scientific journals to look at Mars and how far away it was from the Earth and that, and what kinds of technology maybe could be involved in that you would need to sort of carry out an invasion like that sort of thing, machinery. And he conceived of this idea of the black smoke, poisonous black smoke and the, and the heat ray and all this kind of thing. So, um, so yeah, that, that is basically the story of, and, and, when they decided, Orson Welles and his team decided upon um, War of Worlds as, as to which to hang that fake story on, they basically relocated the story to New York in America. Yeah, and I didn't know that. I didn't really realise that. You know, when I when you you know when we were discussing this. 
And there had been some adaptions of the War of the Worlds that I found a couple of examples from before the, the 1938 broadcast that were sort of um, literature, where they'd reset the story in America. But if, if memory serves me, I think it was places like Chicago and Boston. Yeah. It was out actually, but as for this big monumental radio broadcast that was going to go out, it was New York, yeah. yeah. And, and they were set in New York as well. CBS yeah. was based in New York where it was broadcast And so from. when it was actually broadcast 1938, so what was the date that it was broadcast and how long was the actual broadcast? Right. It was Halloween. Oh, was it? <laughs> yeah. I did not know that. Yeah, yeah, it was Halloween. Oh, wow. Um, and, uh, yeah, let me just confirm that. So, yeah, October the 30th, 1938. Oh, close to Halloween. Not actually yeah, yeah, actual yeah, Halloween, yeah. but pretty It was a Halloween enough. weekend. It was a right. Sunday night. It was, it was oh, okay. So, trying right. to get that sort of weekend audience. Oh, that is you know? interesting. Okay. So, yeah. And it was about an hour and ten minutes or something? It was, it was just, just an hour. Yeah, an hour, was an hour. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we had the actual broadcast, and that would have been a weekend, as you say. It was Sunday night, yes. Yeah. And it was on the uh, CBS, the, um, what, what was the CBS? Uh, again, Columbia something? Broadcasting Columbia System. Columbia Broadcasting yeah. So Columbia, yeah, again, we get all those references, of yeah. course. Um, and, um, you know, I think, so we, we, yeah, people can listen to the broadcast. I think mm. it's on YouTube, so it's you can actually listen yeah. to it. And I, I don't think I've ever actually listened to the broadcast. I've only ever watched a documentary about it. So people can listen to that. And, you mm. know, I think we're going to put this on YouTube and stuff. So probably, I'm sure you'll put some it's links in the description and stuff for people to sort of check it out. Um, but, um, yeah, so looking at that, um, the, f the real thing that's come out of it, which is often quoted, and we're going to go into this in a bit more detail, is that this idea that it caused mass panic and, you know, and actually in the broadcast, Wells actually says, oh, a million people have already left uh, such and such a location, haven't it's they? It's described like that, it's yeah. It's described it's like that. this mass exodus of people moving across. But this is the invasion, of course, that's been depicted in the, in the drama, yeah, yeah. And, and I think that was then repeated afterwards, wasn't it? That, that lots of people, hundreds or thousands of people were so, so concerned but that this broadcast was a real event, that they actually were, you know, mm. go, again, going into the yeah. streets and yeah. stuff. Yeah. But, you know, you, you've got quite a lot of information, which, again, I, I, I'm surprised when you told me this because I didn't think that sort of information was available. Mm -hmm. But this, this wasn't really what happened, was it? No, no, no. And, and, and I think, we're gonna, and then we're going to come on to why there might have been a reason for why they wanted to pe think, pe that, you know, think that that had happened. Yes. Because yes. this was, it wasn't really just, as I said earlier on, um, a broadcast of a play which was done to, you know, there was more to it than that. I, it was actually part of a longer sort of scheme thing, wasn't project, it? Yeah. yeah, so we're going we're gonna to talk about that as well. Um, and, you know, so, so, I mean, I think one of the things which I wasn't aware of, which I think we can talk a little bit about now, was this uh, Princeton radio research uh, pro program or project, how, project. so to talk about that for, for yeah. a few. Yeah, the principal funding behind the radio research project was the Rockefeller Foundation. Mm -hmm. And what's fortunate is, <laughs> it's quite blat blatant really how they're doing it, but you can go on to the Rockefeller's Foundation's official website, and you can download all of their annual reports for what they yep. funded things for from like nine, from the beginning of the foundation, you know, like 1920s, 1910s, 1920s, and you can see right through the late 20s, the 30s. Obviously, they're not docu documenting everything as you and I know. There's a lot of things yeah. that they would have been involved with that they wouldn't have disclosed being involved with financially, but they're still pretty blatant about this kind of thing. Um, they were they were uh, funding numerous. Uh, theatre projects and incidentally one of those projects was something that Orson Welles worked for along with all many of the other players that were involved in the Mercury Theatre that created the War of the Worlds before right. the War of the Worlds they were right. working for this thing called the Federal Theatre Project right um, John Houseman who was um, co-created the Mercury on the air with Orson Welles mm. basically got Orson Welles job with the Federal Theatre Project and they set up this thing called the um, the Negro Theatre Project afterwards as well there's this thing, a uh, play that is staged called Voodoo Macbeth, where they have all these black actors and that. And, and all of it was being funded by the Rockefeller Foundation. Um, so, I, I mean, I'm, it sounds like I'm digressing, but it's very relevant no, because no. Um, we see that throughout the 1930s, the Rockefeller was throwing money left, right and centre at broadcasting at the media. And I mean, I, I was sort of drawing the parallel when we were uh, up in the house there that... Um, you know, the 1920s and radio was coming in and a lot of people have, well, I say a lot, some people have likened that to the birth of the internet. And Absolutely, how, yeah. You know, how this was a new medium and that, and it sounded to me from when we were having that conversation earlier that the, the Rockefellers were obviously quite interested in what the potential of this yes. relatively new medium was. 
essentially, you know, the, the phrase again is social engineering. Yeah. You know, that's that's kind so, of the, the sort of thing yeah. we're looking at now, isn't yeah. it? Going into yeah. this a little bit more detail. I mean, the argument is that people say it's always been about trying to find out what sells, what people will buy, commercial, the commercial side of broadcasting and the media and all that kind of thing. But even in the annual reports themselves and the Rockefellers, they do touch upon that, but they're very much talking about how we can influence the minds, how we can change people's perce perceptions through radio and that sort of thing. And, and to some extent, film as well, Hollywood had, by that point was going with with the film media not not television but you know um, so they're talking ha about how you could change the mindset what what it was ab about certain types of program that people liked how did they feel how did they react to it and that is essentially exactly what the radio research project was about and the the the, the myth of the radio research another myth of the radio research project is that it began in the day after um, the War of the Worlds World broadcast, that the money was given okay. to them at that point by the Rockets. Yeah, but it, that's not true. It's not. It was a year before the War of the World broadcast had, had been broadcast, let alone conceived, you know. And so, was it the case, could, could, can you, if I'm, unless I've misunderstood you, were there some Rockefeller-funded initiatives before War of the Worlds? Yes. Were that uh, Wells was involved in, and do you have the names of those? You know. Yeah, you, I mean, so what, what, what like you say, the, the Federal Theatre Project. Was ah, right, one. Federal yeah. Theatre Project. So, what was was that? Just a general? They doing plays or? Were they, were they... Yeah, it was. It was partly done. Through, and ironically, again, some of the funding for that, not only the foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, it was also come from the General, general Education Board, which the Rockefellers created. Yeah, so yeah. you know, you, you know, it's. it's to Rockefeller money all the way yeah, through it yeah, yeah 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 and the idea with that was to try and <laughs> the create the word the term culture in the modern sense comes yeah. from that because this idea was that you would go out into the community you would tr try and cr find new ways to create culture through the media whether it would be plays and things like that and uh, diversifying again we you know with this the Negro theatre project you know it's this idea of changing the way you see people yeah acting in, 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 in the media and all that kind of thing, you know, bringing in these black coloured actors, you know, and that sort of thing. Right. So, um, there's, a, there's a lot of that, there's a lot of that. It was, it was a real, it was a social engineering project, very, very much so. And, and, the, and the, the, the radio research project was studying um, NBC broadcasts and CBS broadcasts before the War of the Worlds. I've got one example of a show called um, One Man's Family from That's May right, yes, 1938. Which incidentally was sponsored by um, uh, Standard Foods, which is a Morgan outfit, which was also uh, funding the the show that was playing opposite the War of the Worlds. The the, the big show that night was the Chase and Sanborn Hour, which some people erroneously credit as being a, a gaffe that happened in that show caused people to turn up, tune back into the tune off for that and into the War of the Worlds. Which also that's not true. That's evidentially been proven. This thing about the song that guy playing yeah, that song. Yeah, the or Neapolitan something. Love Song, which he didn't actually sing. You know. So we're already getting sort of various myths that have been yes. circulated about the the actual what was going on dur during the broadcast and how it was influencing people. The money was all the money was already there, studying yep. the programming. The people involved in it that people now associate with the study of the War of the Worlds broadcast were already involved in the radio research project through Rockefeller Financing, studying the radio, studying mm -hmm. these programs. The only difference is that. Um, People say that uh, Hadley Cantrell, who was involved with the Radio Research Project and all these other people, went to the Rockefellers the next day and said, can you give us money so that we can study the War of the Worlds broadcast? That's, that's the official version of it. You know, yes, that it happened yeah. after the fact. Even though I can't find any documentation that part of that mandate before the War of the Worlds was that night, we're, we're going to set up this broadcast and you're going to study it. Yeah. But certainly the money was already there. They were already set up to do it. That's exactly what they were there to do. And then the next day, they started researching it. Mm. And that's that to me is not just a coincidence. It's and so that so that was that book, wasn't it? Which that was the Hadley Cantrell book. Mm -hmm. And so that was uh, was that. Correct me if I'm wrong. That was an analysis of the effect of War of the Worlds. Yeah. And I think you. And there's this the book that's got all the letters in it that you know, or, or not the letters themselves, but no. account of all the letters. So can you tell us about that and whether this audience research was actually done and you know. Uh, what it involved, mm. and uh, if I'm correct, that all these letters were studied in this Cantrell book, or was that another? No, that's a, di that's a different. Okay, yeah, right. So, 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 yeah. If you discuss those things, so in other words, what we're going to discuss now then is the aftermath of the broadcast, yeah, and and the claims that were actually made about it, yes, yeah, compared to if you go and look 
at the documentation for the study, what that documentation actually yeah. shows shows you. Yeah, there were, there were a number of polls, a number of surveys that were carried out and really extensive. I mean, you've got to bear in mind that one of the chaps that was involved with the radio research project was Frank, Stan uh, Frank Stanton, okay. who was a market researcher for CBS. He ended up becoming the president of CBS for many, many years. He was a member of the Council on Foreign Relations afterwards. He was the head of the RAND Corporation. You know, it's just really strange stuff, you know. Um, but he was a very influential man at CBS. He had the ear of the Rockefellers and all the rest of it, you know. And so he had the means to carry out this extensive study of how many people listened to the War of the Worlds broadcast in the days, weeks, months afterwards, how they reacted to it, that sort of thing. They also commissioned another of, a number of other surveys. There was a Gallup poll that was conducted, and George Gallup was a good friend of... of um, uh, Rockefeller as well, um, which Rockefeller I can't remember off the top of my head, but yeah. Is it Nelson Rock? Was it, it Nelson, Nelson Rock? Nelson Rockefeller? Was it? It was. Yes, right. it was Nelson Rockefeller. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so they had all that means to do that. So they had a huge amount of information, and there was this uh, lady called Hazel. I'm not, not pronouncing it right. Uh, Hazel Gaudet or something like that. G A U D E T, and she was the linchpin actually of the study because she was the one that did the feet on the ground survey. Yes. She went out there, talked to thousands of people and documented it all so they had a huge amount of information and, and this went on for about two years didn't it this on, research yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Long time it went on for yeah, yeah. and um, ultimately the results that should have come out from that result from that study never appeared because right. there was a huge fallout between Hadley Cantrell yes who authored the the final result the invasion from Mars which is a book which some people might be aware and of when was that published that like, um, I forget it was in the 1940s it was early 1940s something like, yeah, like yeah, something okay, like right, yeah. yeah I don't forget off the top of my head yeah um, and he sampled bearing in mind there was a huge number of people I'll actually read it out for you okay, because yeah. so basically what he did was I'm um, reading from it from actually mm -hmm. from his book here um, he, they studied the, the, the final the data and he said at least a million of them listeners were frightened or disturbed which is very generic but I'll, I'll come into more detail on that in a moment mm. and that statistical data is curious because despite the numbers there was only a dozen or so personal accounts that were were actually cited in them. I think there was about a dozen specifically named individuals that they that they used of that so again from the book we got much of our information was derived from detailed interviews of 135 persons yeah. over a hundred of these people uh, persons were selected because they were known to have been upset by the broadcast mm -hmm. so it was skewed straight away yeah. it was biased towards people who reacted in a in a real mass panic kind of way and I think that was where much of this disagreement... Uh, it was, yes. yeah. yeah, because Paul Lasersfeld and um, Frank Stanton are saying, we've got all this data, why aren't you using it? You know, why it's totally biased. Um, but of course, at that point then, Hadley Control basically took the reins of it all. He took the data off privately and incidentally went to the Rockefellers and got them to help publish that final book, which is the study, uh, The Invasion of Mars, as we know it as the book. And that is where... A, a good part of the myth of mass panic came from yeah. and it was compounded as well by the fact that even Orson Welles himself in interviews on various television programs was saying um, there's been this detailed study he was right there was a detailed study mm -hmm. and the conclusion was that over a million people panicked out of uh, estimated six million, million viewers listeners. right yeah. this sort of is some truth to that because yeah. the data did show that there were approximately six million people listening if you take that into account though compared to how many people were listening to the chase sanborn hour the opposite and the overall radio listening audience yes it's very relatively very small demographic it's not so with that overall audience what we were talking like 20 million 30 million is something like that okay all right yeah and the, 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 there was a reaction from around about a million people estimated from that final data but what's interesting is that that didn't actually use all these letters that we were talking about that's what I was going to yeah afterwards. yeah so and tell then, us about the letters that yeah. and, and what, what where that was published and stuff yeah. so yeah, we have uh, this chap called A. Brad Schwartz, mm -hmm. and he's uh, 2015, 2016, something like that, published this book, which I wasn't aware of, actually. No, I mean, I, 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 I never yeah. heard of it. Yeah, um, called um, Broadcast Hysteria, Orson Welles, War of the Worlds, and the Art of Fake News. That's the book. And he looked at letters that were written to the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC. Also looked at 
uh, letters that were written personally to Orson Welles and to the Mercury Theatre and CBS. Yes. And and uh, bearing in mind, I mean, this is not like millions of letters. You know, I think uh, overall about two thousand letters. Okay. And um, they're all archived in National Archives now. So and um, some stuff that's come through Freedom of Information as well. And in the book, he's put all the sources for where you can go and you can, anybody can go online and, and, and look at this stuff. Yeah. And he took on this really quite a gargantuan task, basically. Mm. He read every single letter, every yeah. single letter, yeah. and documented exactly how people react reacted where they were how much they watched of it how they watched it you know what they yeah. did afterwards and cross-referenced it all basically and i can present the data just as a sort of condensed version of it here so we have um 1355 letters that were written okay. to the mercury theater in orson wells and of them he can he, he found that 957 of them were not frightened uh, 32 were not frightened but saw people who were. Uh, 6 were not frightened but saw panic. Uh, 47 believed that the broadcast was real. 170 were frightened by the broadcast. 14 were told by somebody else and became frightened. 15 were frightened and saw panic. 17 panicked, outright panicked. 5 panicked and saw other people panicking. Uh, 88 didn't hear the broadcast and were not frightened. Uh, 4 didn't hear the broadcast but panicked. <laughs> so he's been very detailed. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so we got a total of uh, 1,355 letters. 1,092 of the, these people were untouched by fright or panic overall. And 263 showed evidence of fright or panic. Uh, so those are the letters to uh, the Mercury Theatre in Orson Welles, mm. and then we have mm. 619 letters written to the Federal Communications Commission, mm -hmm. and we've got 321 of them were not frightened, uh, 12 were not frightened but saw people who were, 2 were not frightened but saw panic, 10 momentarily believed that the broadcast was real, 230 were frightened by the broadcast, 9 were told by somebody else and became frightened, 8 were frightened and saw panic, 4 panicked, Three panicked and saw panic. Mm. <laughs> um, Nineteen didn't hear the panic, uh, the broadcast, and were not frightened. So we have 350 people untouched by fright or panic, and 269 showed evidence of fright or panic. So out of that, we've got a total of three quarters of those letters were not frightened or panicked by it, and a quarter that were. So it's a good average to look at. It is, and I mean, if you, if you take that as like a sample, it's. Yeah. It seems, yeah, it seems like it's yeah. been overhyped. I mean, the only, the only sort of thing I'd say in, 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 in opposition to that is that there may have been people who ran into the streets, but they never wrote any letters, if mm -hmm. you see what I mean. There so, is you know, that. You could, you could make that case, but then again, we yeah. don't have any yeah. evidence, you know, that's no, we just don't, speculation, don't, don't. whereas the letters actually are evidence. Yeah. So. And we also have the data that was gathered from the, the radio research projects mm. and all the others, mm -hmm. and that kind, of, that kind of collates that as well. If you think mm -hmm. about this overall figure of six million, and one million were frightened or disturbed in some way by it. So that, again, tallies, it's only like, what's that, a sixth of it, so we go against a quarter of it. But there's also the additional factor of is, as, as um, Schwartz says in his book, uh, I could read this out to you actually, mm -hmm. because it's, it's interesting to sort of see how he, how he describes it. This idea of the myth is that there was a mass panic. There's no arguing with the fact that some people did get frightened by yeah. it and some people did panic, yeah. but it's not the way it's been portrayed no. in, in, in history. No. So he basically, and I agree with this conclusion, he said, these panic scenes of flight and near flight which turned War of the Worlds into the stuff of American legend did happen, but they were very, very rare. No major, because he's looked at the newspaper reports I yeah. have as well, so we can we can back that up with that as well. No major reports reported any deaths or serious injuries caused by panicked flight. There were no car accidents, no miscarriages, no suicides, because that's another thing that's been added into the myth that somebody people committed suicide and things like that. So that's not the, not the case. As far as we know, anyway, yeah, you know, not nothing was reported. Yeah, no. yeah. Uh, nobody took pot shots at a water tower. That's another myth that that actually came from. They took a chap from Grover's Mill Farm and stood him with his shotgun in front of his farm, took a photograph of him the next day, ah. and it was a publicity stunt. He did not go out shooting at 
water towers in the hills basically but that's yeah, where that, that, no, that's come well. from as well yeah and schwartz has a picture of that in, in the book as well so and the other thing that uh, i think you mentioned to me and i'd never heard of was this story about the uh, looking for a meteorite these people that went out to look for a meteorite which was mixed in with this and it said to be part of the uh, you know, people being convinced that this was a real thing, wasn't it? So tell us about that little, yeah. little story. It's, 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 it's a sad story, really, but it is amusing. <laughs> Basically, what happened was that the um, the Associated Press that we know of today, and there's connections to Rockefeller's there as well, actually, yeah, yeah. But, um, they... Um, Although there wasn't a Martian invasion that they didn't report, well, initially, as this was while the broadcast was going on, they made some inquiries, and uh, they contacted the Philadelphia Inquiry and uh, Inquirer, who subsequently contacted uh, Preston um, Princeton Press Club mm. for confirmation of this story that a meteorite had hit the ground. So nothing to do with Martian invasions mm -hmm. or things mm -hmm. like that, you know. So this caught the attention of this chap called Dr. Arthur F. Buddington, who was the chair of the geology department at Princeton. And he grabbed his associate professor called uh, Harry Hess. They, they jumped into a car, raced off down to Grover's Mill. Yeah. <laughs> and they were really excited about this prospect that they were going to find, you know, they're geologists and all that, you know, they're going to yeah, find a fresh yeah. meteorite in the middle of the night, you know, landed on the ground. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> they're wandering around haplessly in the middle of the dark in the woods. They didn't find anything. They did bump into a few other people who were incidentally actually looking for the meteorite themselves. Again, weren't looking for aliens, weren't panicking. Okay. You know, they were just curious, you know, just into oh, the meteorite in the ground, you know. Um, but what's sad about that is, so it's a perfectly harmless thing that is. But the, and it's typical of the press today, this, this idea of, you know, they reported, they, they factored it into the mass panic. So the next day, we have stories of two Princeton universities who were frightened to death um, by the prospect of the, the Martians were invading Earth. They'd mistaken mm. this radio mm, broadcast. Mm. They'd gone off running into the hills, you know, and tied the meteorite bit into it. Mm. It just wasn't true. Yeah. It wasn't so the they, case they at just, all. The, you know, and the, the, the total the, lack of journalistic, yeah. you know, going out there and look, which is the same today, you know. You know, the impression that I've built up just from what you've told me today is that you know, the, the Rockefellers had this project to see how they could influence people's behaviour and opinions and perception. And that project was in the, you know, control of people like Orson Welles. They may have not known fully what, what the Rockefellers were trying to get from it, but, but if, if we take the argument that they wanted to make their project look more successful than it actually was or more it convinced more people than it actually did then they themselves might have you know gained advantage that oh you know the Rockefellers might have said oh you did a good job on that project so we'll give you some more work yeah you know, yeah you know we can't prove any of that and that's entirely my own speculation but that was the well, there are a lot of coincidences that right <laughs> right that was with, the feeling. especially with Wells yeah yeah that was the feeling because then, then we go on after the you know I don't know whether you want to add to anything to the to the, the actual because we've done the war of the world broadcast we've done the aftermath and the mm. the surveys I mean the only thing I would say sorry is just that um, if you look at it all it is really it was the press that did it and to some degree yeah. the radio and news yeah. media they created that myth yeah um, after the fact and and it was gone out of the newspapers within two to three weeks yeah I remember and most yeah. of that was what yeah. was we were reporting on was there was a possibility the FCC were going to investigate the broadcast to see whether they'd broken any broadcast laws okay. and things like that. There was a few in human interest stories and things like that, but by and large, it, there was nothing it's, more. It's nothing, it was gone. Yeah. So, that, so then we go on to a couple of things which I think, you know, uh, significant is in that uh, Orson Welles, um, he was still involved with the Rockefellers, essentially, weren't, wasn't he? And then, so tell us about that and the RKO thing and how he went on to make uh, Citizen Kane, because I think there's, we talked about the parallels perhaps with uh, the arrangement that Kubrick had to some extent. This, yeah. So to talk about yeah. that. I mean, it, it, I mean, first, before we talk about Citizen Kane, okay. it's worth saying that um, Orson Welles, again, we were talking about the Federal Theatre Project. He also worked for um, the March of Time broadcast, like a news broadcasting thing for radio. And essentially it was an advertising tool for um, Time Life magazine and they would use their own they would source their own news stories and that and they were just basically because another thing that was interesting was it, that it was frowned upon to use real 
uh, footage and real um, broadcast stuff at that point in time in radio history. Uh, the audience expected things to be stage managed. I think it was the Hindenburg disaster that changed that because we had the, the first time that some people had, had to learn to accept that even though it was played, it wasn't broadcast live, but it was played after the fact. But the, people were questioning, well, has this been staged? You know, but and people were really frowning on that. You know, but so I think that kind of played into the the, the nature of the way in which War of the Worlds could have been perceived, believing that. Something because you were saying yeah. that Orson Welles actually used to do impersonations he of did. people to, yes. to actually report the news about On them the rather than time, actually, because yeah. as we were saying it, as you were telling me, and I, you know, it's obvious really because recording equipment wasn't was probably quite expensive and not that portable, mm. so it wasn't as it wasn't as easy to actually record That's news right. stories and then broadcast Custom. them. Yeah. So you said like Orson Welles was doing. As, as he was impersonating uh, politicians and, and and industrial leaders and people. You know, all these notable people. You know, yeah. He was playing roles. I mean, he wasn't the only one. There was many many characters, yeah. and actors that were doing this yeah. for the march. Of and the that time. was just the way that it was done. It wasn't particularly yeah. that Orson Welles yeah. was trying to trick people or deceive people it just that's yeah that was the sort of uh, convention yeah. then wasn't it he, he learned he was schooled very very well he learned from that because he used that in the war of the worlds as well because he used an actor to portray this um, secretary of the interior that's right, but yeah. he, the, he instructed him to impersonate roosevelt yeah you know, president roosevelt yeah. Yeah. make it sound like roosevelt and he wanted to actually have it be roosevelt that made the announcement in the broadcast but the cbs lawyers said we won't be able to get away with that we'll get sued for doing that you know so and he said make it nondescript make it not sound anything like anybody that we could be recognizable well snuck in there at the last minute and said impersonate Roosevelt and that's that is you know it does really bring out the sort of fake news type of uh, you know intent doesn't it for it if you because if it was just meant to be like a real thing they wouldn't need to name specific people to that's do an impression right. of kind of yeah, thing you know it, yeah. so yeah so that's very interesting and so 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 it was after that then yeah afterwards yeah um, he goes off to, uh, and the other thing I've mentioned before about that is the March of Time, obviously, mm, yeah. uh, run by um, Time Life, which was yeah. financed by the Rockefellers as well. Again, so you know that, yeah. It's all around. So he goes, he gets uh, War of the Ca Worlds is obviously um, because of the press around it, gets real notoriety in America, you know, and War Orson Welles is hailed as this legend of uh, broadcasting. You know, he could do anything. He really did. And it's a very much like what happened to Stanley Kubrick in that respect, um, because he gets this um, contract with RKO, which at that point was being majority ran by the Rockefellers, Nelson Rockefeller, you know, he was, he was, yeah, they, he was on the board of directors at RKO. And they give him this deal where he can go off and make Citizen Kane, the film. You can make it however you want, you can do, and it was a real labour intensive film. He got slammed for the way he made the film, you know, all these things. People say that they're all original things that he did with that film, but he, he, he milked an awful lot of things that people have already done. But it was the way in which he did it and the way he put it all in there, and it seemed like he'd done it for the first time, you know. So, um, so you know, he was riding high. There was nothing he could do wrong, you know. And that, mm -hmm. and that is the that is the contention that some people come across. I'm not sure how much I would go along with that, but I can see the parallels that people who talk about when we come to this idea of the, the overall psyop of the war of the mm. world surely but um, if you accept the fact that he was that he was tasked by the likes of the Rockefellers to do this psychological experimentation with the broadcast and then the the, the way it was put the mass panic was publicized afterwards it, and you then you are thinking there's a line in Citizen Kane actually where um, Kane says, uh, oh, I don't believe you hear everything in the radio, you know, and it's like he's nodding and winking at the camera. He wasn't doing an impression of Richard D. Hall, was he, at that point? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, only half of what you yeah, believe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so that's what he was doing. And people say, maybe, I mean, also bear in mind that. Um, Citizen Kane is based on uh, Hearst as well, you know. Okay, I don't know. And you're, told, about that, you're kind of. It's alluding to this idea of newspaper magnets and all that kind of thing. Oh, okay. Story. Ah, yes, of course. You know, so okay, it kind right. of ties yeah. into the Morgans and the Rockefellers again and all that. So, you know. So, and people would say, well, why would they have let them do that? Because they were financing him at that point mm -hmm. then for RKO. But he did. And people say it's a bit like what um, Kubrick Stanley Kubrick, Kubrick did. Yeah. With the shining, yeah, and we have the, yeah, the carpet yeah. on the wall behind yeah. us, you know. You know, I mean, I, with, I, the, with the NASA stuff. Yeah, that's right. And I mean, I, you know, the, while we've been talking, I'm thinking, well, to summarise an idea, and it is an idea, it's total speculation that you know, Orson Welles helped them fake an alien invasion, and. Uh, 
Kubrick either acted as a consultant or maybe helped them fake uh, the moon landing. You know, it's, yeah, it's maybe it's, not it's, like that really. No, but, but that's, it, it you know, makes you think. Yeah, makes you think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So there's so there's, there's a parallel, there. and then I think. But the um, difference is obviously with Orson Welles is he basically screwed up his contract with RKL very very quickly right. because he took too many liberties, and they renegotiated his contract with him very very quickly, and they they reined him right in, yeah. and he that really was the only success he had in his t career. Legendary, obviously, yes. and a, and a, and, a, and a fantastic director and actor, but. I think it again. It was appreciated more after after the time, fact, wasn't yeah. It? When it was released, it was uh, critically panned. Yeah. It was uh, yeah, because I'd never I'd never seen it, and I'd heard it. I think I'd seen various. Uh, mm. We're going off the point a little bit, but got, seen various movie uh, lists, film lists. You know, saying what the best, best top ten films and yeah. Citizen Kane was the number one or number yeah. two or something. You know, and, and I've never seen it. So yeah. Anyway, uh, interesting thing. I mean, yeah. The only other thing I would really say about Orson Welles is even when that. Didn't contract got negotiated yeah. he was still very much sort of I mean he got sent off to um, it was the early 1940s so I think it was towards the end of his contract because things went quite sour quite quickly for RKO Rockefeller's mm. kind of pulled out of RKO in the early 40s around about the same time that Orson Welles departed with his contract but he one of those last things that he did for them he was sent off as part of that good neighbours policy um, the propaganda arm for, for the government uh, down to South America which also, Walt Disney was as well, you know, with his animators, you know, in the, so it kind of ties in with that as well, you know, that, and there's a number of people actually, I think, um, oh, I can't remember off the top of the head, but I think Reagan might have been one of them as well, actually, um, it was a, yeah. yeah, I'd have to confirm that, but there was a number of people that I found that actors and key people at that point early, you know. And so what was the good neighbours thing again? I think you did mention it to me, I can't remember. It anymore. was basically to acclimatise, um, um, it was propaganda in yeah. South America, the perceptions of what was actually going on in the world with regards to Europe and, and the Nazis and things like that, the, the, the heating up for the Second World War, and what was going on actually in the Second World War. And what, were they making like alloys? And were they making documentaries? Or? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. He made, he, yeah. There was this guy that coined the term documentary that you mentioned, wasn't Yeah, it? I mean, yeah, that was, uh, that was a bit, bit earlier for that, yeah, but that yeah, was one yeah. of the things that the Rockefellers document in their reports, that um, uh, 1925 this was, so Oh, yeah. so over 10 years yeah. before the War of the Worlds and the Rockefeller fun Foundation funded uh, a project by this chap called John Grierson and he was an academic who studied social sciences and the mass media so yeah. social studies so it's, again it's that kind of thing uh, and his job under that project was to study the influence of films on public opinion yeah so yeah. and he later became a film director in his own right and like you say he coined the term documentary yeah. so yeah. Yeah. yeah there's a number there are many many things you can read they make for fascinating reading if people have got the time to sit there and read those reports because it goes it goes on i mean you go into like the 40s and 50s when they were financing the 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 new york museum of modern art and all that kind of thing you know the rockefellers yeah so it's uh, mm -hmm. so i think the next thing to mention then is the um the uh polish border incident which was you know meant to be the start of the uh Second World War, and then and there was a, ref a pan apparent reference in uh, one of Hitler's speeches as well, which was new to me as well. So, do you want to mention yeah, I've, that? Yeah, I have actually confirmed it. I mean, it's um, you know, it's uh, it's bizarre. He's got uh, November the eighth, nineteen thirty-eight. So it's just over yeah, a, a week. Of weeks, isn't it? Oh, wait, over a week. Oh, just yeah, over a yeah, week yeah, after yeah. that. Yeah, just over a week. Yeah. Um, yeah, 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 it would be. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, Hitler standing there in Munich with his speech and he says obviously this is in English I'm not going to do an impersonation of him <laughs> um, he says I have to do everything and will do everything to keep Germany so well armed and equipped that her peace can never again be threatened that does not mean that I will start a war scare in the world a panic perhaps an impending invasion of Martians mm, very interesting so yeah, yeah. right so what was Hitler, uh, <laughs> how was he briefed, you know? So we jump forward, <laughs> yep. less than a year later, August 31st, 1939. And this has been documented as well now. Yes. Um, we have a secret SS, SS unit that basically staged a, a mock attack on a radio station uh, in, is it Gleiwitz in Germany? Okay. Just across the border from Poland. And this unit wore Polish uniforms, military uniforms, and they burst into the station, and they, were, they laid siege to it, and um, I'm just reading from my notes here, yeah, That's it's, right. it's just bizarre. Uh, they began broadcasting in Polish that they were the vanguard of a Polish invasion of Germany. 
and the men fired their guns into the air they left behind a, apparently um, a dying concentration camp inmate who was dressed in a bullet ridden uh, civilian clothing and if you look and it's been suggested as well that that was orchestrated by Heinrich Himmler as well as okay. you know, so uh, and the Gestapo so make of that what you will but certainly it happened and it was yes. staged yeah. but, but you, we have the next day basically yeah. Germany declares war on Poland, Poland yeah. and says that Poland attacked us last night and you know they they cited this this broadcast as being real yeah so, so it's a essentially false flag. started yeah. the it's a false flag of the second world war yeah yeah a yeah. false flag you know and, and i suppose <laughs> unless there's anything you want to expand on in that bit that's sort of the logical next step is the uh, you know the 9/11 false flag yeah you know absolutely. and some of the powers that you'd found there just in terms of sort of not so much any people, but some of the um, narrative mm. that was in the War of the Worlds. You've drawn parallels between that narrative that was given mm. both by H.G. Wells and perhaps in the, in the Orson Welles broadcast. Yeah. Um, and some of the little little sort of bits of, of, of uh, the accounts that came out around 9-11. So mention a couple of those. Yeah, I mean, I, I like many people when I when I... I, I was there watching 9/11 pretty much from 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 the moment it was first you know what we saw on television, and I there was just something that just did not sit right for me. Mm. It just did mm. not seem real. It looked like something that had been faked. You know, I'm not saying you know you know, but yeah, yeah, there yeah. was that element to it. Yeah. That something wasn't right. Something just didn't feel right. I'm not saying that footage we saw was fake. That's not yeah. what I'm saying. No, I mean well, with me, I just mentioned that very briefly. Yeah, when I saw the towers, you know. I thought they were coming down, that's what I was told then, and I mm. believed it, but I thought there'd been an earthquake, <coughs> and I thought, oh, the towers have been destroyed by an yeah. earthquake, yeah. and then I thought, there's the, the, you know, New York's not in an earthquake zone, and I just, that was it, I just forgot about it then. Yeah. So that was my way of thinking, oh, this is not quite right, but I didn't process it any further because I was too shocked, but anyway, carry on. Yeah, and and the strange, the really eerie thing is, and people have only got my word to go for on this one, but there was two things that stuck in my mind, uh, and this is not to try and connect it to the mm -hmm. extraterrestrial phenomenon, mm -hmm. because I think there's a separate thing going on there with War of the Worlds mm -hmm. with that. Um, but I couldn't help but think about Independence Day, as one example, and I couldn't help but think about the radio broadcast of the War of the Worlds at the time right. as well. Right. And that really stuck in my mind, that did, for many, many years afterwards. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 when I've said this to you before, um, and I, I did briefly ask Dr. Judy Wood about this as well when we, when we talked about it in a conference that she did over Skype, yeah. um, because I nearly fell off my chair when uh, Dr. Judy Wood had a, a similar reaction to it, yes. you know, and she actually writes this in her book, Where Did the Towers, Towers Go? go. Yeah. You know, she felt like it was like a War of the Worlds type, that there was just something about it that just, and I thought, wow, you know, this is just, for somebody else to con confirm that feeling with me, because mm. I thought it might be just me that was thinking, you know. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, really for me, um, I, I do see those parallels. For one is is the dust cloud, for example, on 9/11, and you see the footage of, of, of people running away and all that. There is the scene. This is taped now from uh, WABC here in New York. Uh, their crew shot this picture, as you see, uh, fire trucks and firefighters, rescue personnel at the Trade Center, about 30 blocks from where we are right now and you can see these huge columns of smoke uh, coming off of the front tower and then a bit from the back as you see again the crews working their way towards the towards the tower themselves I do remember seeing footage of, of, of ships pulling away from you know on the, on the um, by the World Trade Center that sort of thing um, which made me think about that um, that section of the war or broadcast where we have the black smoke. I don't like you, you know, the comparison in terms because of it being black. Fuming, yeah. I don't want to yeah. say that so the, the smoke dust on. is yeah. black. Yeah, but it's still that idea. It's it's moving, and and the reporter is actually can't, it's moving this street. It's now on the next street. It's now on the next street, and the people are running. I'm speaking from the roof of Broadcasting Building, New York City. The Bells you hear are ringing to warn the people to evacuate the city as the Martians approach. Now I look down the harbor, all, all manner of boats, overloaded with fleeing population, pulling out from docks. The enemy is now in sight above the Palisades. Five 
five great machines. Now they're lifting their metal hands. This is the end now. Smoke comes out, black smoke drifting over the city. People in the streets see it now. They're running toward the East River, thousands of them, dropping in like rats. Now the smoke's spreading faster. It's reached Times Square. People are trying to run away from it, but it's no use. They, they're falling like flies. Now the smoke's crossing 6th Avenue. 5th Avenue. A uh, hundred yards away. It's... It's 50 feet. For me, it just evoked that scene, Same those sort scenes of, scene, of people yeah. running away. Yeah. As you yeah. could see the dust cloud of the of the destruction of the of the buildings in on 9/11. Yeah. 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 As it's moving through the streets, you know, section by section, people running away and that, and people getting caught in the dust cloud and choking, all that kind of thing. It's, it it really does parallel that. Um, of course, say like the you know people piling onto the ships and leaving as well, and all that you know, like with yeah. the ferries in New ferries, York yeah. on 9/11. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, then we have uh, this. Uh, even if you think of things like people going out and looking for holes in the ground, I mean, it makes me think of like the Shanksville thing with the <laughs> with the play, you know, or that mm-hmm. that alleged scenario, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. And um, mm-hmm. there's just so many synchronicities there. And people might look at it and say, "Oh, that's a bit of a stretch," you know. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but it's just we're just observing. Yeah, that, right? it it is, we don't know if there's is, any significance. No, no, to no. It, I'm, I'm not. I'm not no, saying, no, but, but you know, I'm just really noting that. To, the idea as well of, as in the War, War of the Worlds broadcast, which is at the core of what this is all about, mm, mm. the idea of being told that you are being invaded by aliens, yeah, you know, in yes, War of the Worlds, yeah. and no, then no, no, being told yeah. you're being invaded by, by terrorists. terrorists. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so that's the same sort of psychological well. triggers. Yeah, it really, is. Isn't it? Yeah, so very that's much so. Is what we're saying. Yeah, yeah, potentially. And of course, we have. Roosevelt um, in person, you know, the, the, the secretary of the interior yeah, yeah. sounds like the president saying we will not be beaten, we will not be, mm-hmm. you will prevail and all this, and there's all mm-hmm. Bush doing it on 9-11 as well, you know, mm-hmm. so yeah, mm-hmm. there, there are parallels there in that respect, mm-hmm. yeah. You know, and we can make a case that uh, the, they were sort of doing research into how to deliver a potential news story to have the maximum uh, effect on people's perception. They started doing that as early as 1938. I think so. So by, yeah, so by the time they got to 2001, you know, they they probably pretty much got it all down. Got a good down, handle on it, yeah. You know, because that's uh, sort of uh, six, 63 years, if my maths is correct, that they uh, potentially were working on that that yeah. type of uh, you know strategy. So one of the other figures then, Carl, that's cropped up in this thread of the research is a, a, a character called C.D. Jackson, and there seems to be some kind of unusual coincidences or links or whatever you want to call them uh, about this guy, because uh, he has some connection to the War of the Worlds uh, broadcast, but I think it's rather tangential, isn't it? Mm. And then, but he was also involved with NICAP, which was the, um, which was the national uh institution yeah national investigations committee on aerial phenomena wasn't it so they were basically looking at ufos weren't they yeah. so tell us about cd jackson what his connection to war of the world's uh, scenario was and some of the you know coincidences if you want to call them that in relation to one of the other famous us ufo cases that uh, has been discussed many mm. times i mean it, it is like you say it is very tangential okay. uh, it's, um because where, where you look, because the, there is this notion that out and out the broadcast was a psychological operation, you know, it's orchestrated as well as a study afterwards. And depending on what sources you go and look at, some will say certain people will insert C.D. Jackson's name into it. And they'll say C.D. Jackson was doing it on behalf of the Rockefellers. Okay. And this is a very, very difficult thing to prove. Um, so initially I wanted to look at the kind of people who were saying that and in what context. And I found it interesting that the, the main people in this was, um, because it's worth mentioning actually as well, we'll start with the, we'll start with the 1970s actually, because yeah. Orson Welles made this film called F for Fake. I wanted and, to mention that I can, that as well, I can yeah. insert the clip into this. Yeah, I do, yeah. 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 Uh, it did this, made this nine minute trailer, which never got aired, but it was eventually put to the DVDs for, uh, for this F for Fake film. 
and in he he talked about secret sponsors of the of the War of the Worlds um, hoax and whatnot, as he calls it. But he says these secret sponsors were extraterrestrials. He and does, you can, yeah. yeah, and you can say, well, you can believe that if you, you know, I'm he not going to do it. He says, he says you can believe, you can believe that, that if you want to. Yeah. Who knows? And all this kind of yeah. thing. You know? And um, we'll leave that to you f for you f f for now and all this yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. You know, it's very sort of overdramatic. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, suppose I come right out with it and admit to you now that my old Martian hoax on the radio was, well, not exactly a hoax. That there were secret sponsors of that broadcast who were, in fact, some rather influential beings from outer space. You smile. Ten seconds more, Orson. I think they're smiling, Gary, and I'd just like to remind them that it is since that broadcast that there have been in this country alone authenticated sightings. You still think it's a joke? Good. That's the way we want you to feel about it. For now. But I think people have took that literally and said, well, yeah, is, uh, is that the case? And, uh, and I'm not saying that this is the case with this chap, but William Cooper, who wrote that document, um, Majesty 12, and he was talking about uh, staged false flag extraterrestrial scenarios and that, you know. And... Um, I think it's come from there actually and it okay. come from that because he was talking he was putting the war of the worlds context uh, he was saying war of the worlds was to do with a false flag extraterrestrial scenario uh, testing the waters for people to see if they would accept an alien invasion you know with a false yeah. flag that sort of thing so and we know that that kind of thing goes on with the CIA you know they've been involved in that for years you know with the Durant report and uh, all that kind of thing and the Brookings Institute ties into it as well well, why about the interest in that people have inserted C.D. Jackson into that is because you say C.D. Jackson was a member of NICAP, but we have this documented history of NICAP basically run by the CIA. Okay. Everybody in NICAP will, that was heavily involved in NICAP will deny it, but I found huge amounts of people who were members of NICAP, prominent positions in NICAP, who also worked formally for the CIA or work, in, work concurrently within the CIA. Mm -hmm. And the naysayers will say, no, no, that was coincidence. You know, they kept their interests separate from NICAP. And I do not accept that at all. So what was C.D. Jackson's role then in all of this? But, you know, he was on NICAP. What else did he do? Wasn't he connected to the National Security Council? Was that something yeah, else? Yeah, yeah. I mean, he was... Um, Which was the forerunner of the CIA, wasn't it? And um, just a few bits and pieces I found about him that he, he graduated from Princeton University. <laughs> so we've already got a tie in there with the, with the Princeton, Princeton Radio, Radio, Radio Research, Research yeah. Project. Yeah. And many of those involved with it were, were Princeton luminaries anyway. So mm -hmm. uh, he worked in the media in the industry uh he worked at time magazine <laughs> okay. so yeah we're tying it in there as well um he was involved with this anti-isolationist group in 1940 so we're after the broadcast now called the council for democracy mm -hmm. he was one of the main funders of the uh, british security coordination for the fight of freedom group um as other members include the likes of alan dulles um william uh, lewis william douglas and uh, people like that and uh, elmer davis who was worked for cbs as well so he was in, yeah um close connections with ian fleming as well things ah. like that so interesting chap cd jackson yeah really mm -hmm. but during the second world war he became a, a special assistant to the ambassador for turkey mm -hmm. before joining the oss in 1943, uh -huh. so we got a forerun of the CIA there. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the sub uh, following year, he was appointed Deputy Chief of Psychological Warfare Division at Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Forces, the SHAFE, during the so it's a prominent, prominent role in uh, psychological warfare. So I think that is the reason why. And uh, of course, he went on to become managing director of Time Life magazine after the war as well. So he, I think this is why people have been tying this in constantly. If we look at his role involved with the OSS, which subsequently went to be the CIA, and he did work um, ad, hoc, ad hoc with the CIA mm -hmm. as well. So we jump back to uh, the stuff with NICAP. Yeah. And we and we look at all the muddling that's gone on there. And what I thought was really interesting, you saying about some of these prominent cases that came out of NICAP. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't know this until really recently, I <laughs> out that um, 
one of the key initial people that interviewed Betty and Barney Hill mm. of their encounter mm. was C.D. Jackson. Yeah, he was appointed yeah. to do this by yeah. uh, Donald Kehoe. And he was the one that, that put them under hypnosis and got that initial uh, account from under mm. hypnosis, which mm. has been muddied all over the place, you know, that has some... Mm. Yeah. Um, so I think you can, if, you, if we can acknowledge there at that point... Knowing what you and I know, and what many people will know as well about that with Betty and Barney mm-hmm. Hill, if he was involved in muddling, which is psychological warfare, mm-hmm. for the intelligence community, on, 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 in that regard, UFOs, then it would stand to reason that he would be doing that for the media as well. Um, so I think that is why people have tied C.D. Jackson into it. If they want to give the, the false flag E.T. angle, to War of the Worlds. That would be the way they do it. Mm. Unfortunately, it comes to a dead end with C.D. Jackson right. because with all of these co- uh, circumstantial evidence, there is no hard evidence that C.D. Jackson was direct, was connected to the radio research project and and the broadcast at the time. So he's just a contemporary so, of the events, not necessarily yeah, connected yeah, to. That, them. that is where it all falls apart on that that point there. Mm. And I'm not saying that there may well be evidence out there. Yeah, it's just um, yeah, yeah. but. That is yeah, sadly yeah, where, where it, yeah. it ends with that, yeah. Okay. So uh, I, I believe then, Carl, that uh, what 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 sort of prompted uh, us doing this is that you're working on this new book, which is going to contain this information. Is it? Because you're still in the process of you know yeah. adding bits and pieces and uh, and just and just finding out bits. And, so tell us about the book. The book. Um, uh, tentatively at the moment is called um, Popcorn for the Mind, but it's a, it's basically a study mm. of. Um, the, the, the ins and outs, the nuts and bolts of the way the media works, where yes. television came from in the first place. What was the intention behind it? Is there any truth to this idea that it was social engineering from the get-go? Worldview warfare, if you want to yeah. call it that as well. It gets into the realms of mind control. I'm looking at the, the physiological effects on people as well. You know, this, mm-hmm. uh, how it, you know, the alpha state that people go into when they yeah. watch television, how it affects people's sleep, how it affects people's ability to dream at night as well and things like that from watching too much television before yeah, they go to bed. Yeah, we talked about that yeah, a little yeah. bit yeah, before. And and the the um, audible levels as well, you know, the suborals and things like that, subliminals mm-hmm. as well is another area. Mm-hmm. Um, but when you're looking at all this, and I wanted to look at fake news as well, I don't mm-hmm. like using that term because it's been it's become it's, Gone, it's been yeah. spun now, yeah. Um, but uh, fakery in the in the media, let's put it mm-hmm. that one, yeah, and uh, obfuscation that sort of thing, and that looking at newspaper reports and news news articles and things like that and it, it, it did naturally bring me to the war of the worlds and i was going to just because i'd mentioned it in science fiction the hidden global agenda did a chapter on that which is sort of an overview of it and i thought um shall i just give that a docker token nod or shall i go and have a do a little bit more mm-hmm. just to see and i did and i went away and it was weeks and weeks and weeks and went by and i ended up with over 100 pages of uh, yeah so uh, there's a possibility that it may even be a book in its own right at the moment yeah. yet if i have more because yeah. it's still an ongoing thing but if not it will be a big part of the, of the popcorn for the mind book okay okay well uh, i look forward to finding out more about that when it comes out and uh, I think we're sort of going to post this in the next uh, few, few days, couple of weeks or whatever. So, um, and, and I think you're going to edit, edit some stills in and that sort of thing to just sort of inform the uh, discussion. Um, but for now, well, I'll say thanks for spending some time with me Thank today just to go through this. And um, yeah. it's all adds to my knowledge and uh, understanding of the way that these uh, shenanigans are working. Yeah. And I hope it, that, that it adds uh, to other people's knowledge. I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.